Hello everybody and welcome to Toy 2 to You Curator's Corner episode number 11. My name's Sean Brosnan, I'm a curator at Toy 2 Otago Settlers Museum and I'm making these little films during the coronavirus lockdown of 2020. Today's story is going to be about the place of Maori in Pioneer Dunedin. By that I'm referring first of all to the various ways in which local Maori participated in the establishment of the first settlement, but also I'm going to talk about a specific location in the Pioneer Village that was uniquely associated with Māori. Their special spot, if you like. And the ways in which that was used for the first 15 years or more of Dunedin history, but then how suddenly it disappeared. Now, Otapoti is commonly used as the Māori name for Dunedin, and it's derived from the name of a kike, or village, that was formerly at the head of the harbour around the Toitu stream area. It probably means something like the place of the boats, or perhaps as far as you can go by boat. An interesting description of Otipoti and other Māori sites in the greater Dunedin area was published in an article in the Evening Star newspaper in 1892 by a writer who went by the nom de plume, He Wahine, a woman. I'll put a link to that in the description. There don't seem to have been any Māori actually living in Otipoti by the time the first settlers arrived in Dunedin. But the Otipoti Tauraka Waka, the canoe landing site around the mouth of the Toitu, was definitely still in use. There were plenty of reasons why Kaitahu might have made forays up the head of the harbour from their main settlements clustered around its entrance in this period. We can see, for instance, uh, a little cluster of farirau, the beehive-shaped um, structures that were used by Kaitahu on food-gathering expeditions in this painting of the South Dunedin Flat by Catherine Valpy in 1849, and the Otipoti Tauraka Waka would have been a primary access point for such expeditions. It was on the gravel beach where the Toitu stream poured into the harbour, a few yards below the bridge that we talked about in the last episode. And as we've seen, this was also the spot where the first settlers disembarked from their small boats on first landing in 1848, before they constructed the small jetty at what is now Jetty Street. Māori, however, continued using their traditional landing place and camping there whenever they had business in Dunedin. It was therefore known as the place in Dunedin where Māori congregated, their landing place, and it was right at the heart of the village. Māori business with Pioneer Dunedin was quite wide-ranging. There was employment to be had, for instance, as the town developed. New Zealand company records, for example, show that it was Māori labour that was substantially responsible for the construction of the main immigration barracks on the foreshore in 1848, the subject of our episode number five. Reverend Thomas Burns also employed two Māori for several months in that year as he undertook the landscaping and development of his manse site, which was the subject of our episode number two. He even records how they went on strike at one point when they discovered that Europeans were getting paid a higher rate and demanded the same. Then James Adam achieved his amazingly quick four-day house construction, the subject of episode 8, because he employed two Māori to build it with him, fuddy style. And numerous other pioneers followed his lead in contracting uh, Māori skills. There were also many references to Māori boatmen being employed on the harbour, plying their trade, carrying freight and passengers, as well as Richard Driver's Māori pilot boat crew, who were often the very first people that newly arrived immigrants would meet at the entrance of the harbour as new ships arrive from Great Britain. But the activity I want to focus on most is Maori food supplies to the early settlers, a critical source of sustenance during those first years, and one that is particularly associated with the Otipoti Tauraka Waka. Maori would run their boats up onto the beach there, then spread out their wares, usually fish and potatoes, on the gravel for sale. For a considerable period, Māori continued to trade in central Dunedin, sleeping on the beach under their upturned boats when they were in town. But when they began to get harassed at night by drunken Scotsmen, this became something of a scandal. And in 1858 or so, the Otago Provincial Government voted money to erect a dedicated hostelry for them on Prince's Street. The Māori house, as it was known, was erected by the landing place on the site where the chief post office would later be, which is now the Distinction Hotel. We have the architect's drawings for it at Toitu, so we can identify it in photographs of central Dunedin from 1859 to the mid-1860s. It had a lower floor for cooking and eating spaces, and sleeping quarters up above. We also know from one newspaper report that large Maori wedding parties sometimes stayed there, 
sleeping in the house in the manner of a meeting house to the shock of some of the town's Presbyterian ministers, who felt that having both sexes sheltered together like this was simply indecent. But somewhere on the way, that early strong trading relationship with Kaitahu seems to have atrophied, and Maori became gradually marginalised as settler society developed. This is perhaps symbolised by the fate of the Maori house itself. In 1865, only six years after its completion, the house stood in the way of the planned widening of Princes Street. So the roof was removed and the house was buried under the expanded roadway, a process you can see underway in this photograph. It was supposed to be rebuilt elsewhere, but this just never happened. It would in fact be a century and a half before the early promise of a bicultural relationship in central Dunedin would once again begin to develop. Memorials such as this on Princes Street are part of a resurgent kaitahu cultural and economic presence in the city of Dunedin, a process that honours those who were here before as well as those who came so far to found the city. So I hope you enjoyed that little story and perhaps you'll look anew at the corner of the Distinction Hotel in Water Street and imagine, perhaps, the bones of the Maori house still buried under the street. It's possible.